Good morning, church. Welcome to this service of worship at Oakland United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. I am Pastor Carolyn. As we begin our worship, I would invite you to take time to center yourself, to set aside any distractions so that you can be fully present to God. If you're carrying worries or fears or burdens, I would invite you to set them down, at least for this time of worship, so that you can focus on truly connecting and worshiping God. If at the end of the worship service you want to pick those things up again, you certainly can, but please know that if you are willing to let them go, God will carry them for you or help you to carry them. Let us pray. We come to the fountain of the waters of life, thirsty for life that is meaningful. God pours out for us God's very own spirit, and we open our hearts to God's good gift, praising God for the life God has given us. And we pray that in this time of worship, God will refresh us. May we allow God to move in our lives, change our minds, soften our hearts, direct our feet, so that we may follow God more faithfully this day and all days. Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed on the third day, and, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is, come, is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Join with me as we sing Servant Song in the United Methodist book, The Faith We Sing, number 2222.
Our second scripture reading this morning is from Romans 12, 9 through 21. The marks of a true Christian. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Loving God, as we hear your word this morning, may the seed of the teaching take root deep in our hearts and bear the fruits of the spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and self-control that will overflow into our lives in our words and our actions. Amen. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the PBS program Antiques Roadshow. On that show, a team of appraisers, specialized experts in everything rare and antique, sets up shop in a convention center in a major city. And people bring treasures from their attics, coffee tables, or safe deposit boxes, or the garage sale, flea market, or thrift shop finds they hope will be valuable. Or sometimes their most treasured family heirlooms, all to have them evaluated and appraised. The program is composed entirely of brief one and two minute appraisals. In each of these segments, one of the experts looks over a person's treasure, listening to the story behind each other item, and searching for the maker's mark or telltale design features that would indicate its worth and identify it as genuine. Then we get to watch the expression on the person's face as the expert gives the value of the item and declares that it's the real thing or sometimes identifies it as just a fake. Now many of these items have sentimental value which means that their owners would treasure and keep them regardless of the appraisal but still, it is a special joy for the owner to learn that great grandpa's old chair is indeed a genuine federal period piece, or that the picture that's always hung over the fireplace is by a well-known artist, or that costume jewelry necklace and bracelet set that's been languishing in grandma's jewelry box for years is actually genuine vintage Tiffany with a platinum setting and real diamonds worth enough to put your child through college and grad school. Let love be genuine, says the Apostle Paul in our reading from Romans this morning. Paul, of course, didn't have antiques in mind when he wrote those words. He had in mind the authentic love that should characterize the Christian life. And in the rest of the passage, Paul goes on to list some of the telltale distinguishing features of this genuine love. Our passage this morning builds on the first eight verses of chapter 12, where Paul calls upon believers in Christ not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. But our reading also builds on the first 11 chapters of Paul's letter as well. Paul has spent the first 11 chapters of his letter to the Christians at Rome assuring the formerly Jewish Christians and formerly Jewish pagans Christians and formerly pagan Christians in the Roman church 
that God's justifying grace in Jesus Christ is extended to Jews and non-Jews alike. And now Paul moves with a resounding therefore at the beginning of chapter 12 to detail the implications of God's grace for the way in which we live our lives as individuals and as communities of faith. Our reading then moves from the general to the specific to set forth love as the ethical foundation for all the subsequent actions and appeals that follow. These chapters concern how to live as a community that bears witness to the power of God's righteousness. Let love be genuine. By genuine love, Paul means non-hypocritical love. Love without hidden motives or agendas, without the desire to manipulate or coerce another. And the word for Greek, the Greek word for love that Paul uses here is agape, which is a generous, self-giving, unselfish love. Showing agape love to others is our human response to the agape love and mercy of God conveyed by Christ to us and to every person. Paul continues, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Now the word translated as as hate is a very strong word, more on the order of abhor or detest. It's not simply expressing a distaste for, but taking an active stance against what is evil and also holding fast to what is good. Part of a distinctly Christian character in Paul's eyes is not only simply to avoid doing wrong. Instead, the Christian must actively seek to do right. And the Greek word used here to mean hold fast can also mean be translated as glue together. More than hanging on, Paul is reminding Christians of the need to glue yourself to the good, attach yourself to the good, literally become part of what is good. And the first thing that comes from gluing yourself to the good is to love one another with mutual affection. Now the Greek has several words for love and the word for love used here is Philadelphia, which is brotherly or sisterly love. Love which is sustained by mutual affection and by actively taking the lead in honoring one another. Then Paul continues, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Paul's specific choice of words in these verses lend intensity to his message. Paul is telling the Romans, don't just do these things when the occasion arises. Instead, they are called to intentionally seek out ways to honor one another and others to serve, rejoice, show compassion, contribute to the needs of community, extend hospitality to strangers, to live in harmony with others, to associate with those of lower status. This is how we as individuals and as a Christian community embody genuine love. Paul goes on, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Living peaceably with everyone is tough, 
enough in our highly partisan society where social media as well as media outlets on the right and left loudly ampl amplify political differences and differing views on so many issues. But it's even more challenging to embody love for the enemy when our whole political system seems to depend on dividing up and identifying those whom we should fear and even those whom we should hate. And when we are threatened or attacked, the temptation is strong to strike back, to fight fire with fire. I can give no better example of the significance of Paul's admonitions about how to respond to evil than the words of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. from his book, A Testament, from the book, A Testament to Hope, the essential writings of Martin Luther King Jr. He writes, the ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. So it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. These are powerful words for any time, but especially for now, when we are so deeply divided in so many ways and bullying and violence in actions and words are so common. In case anyone has been deluded into thinking otherwise, Paul makes crystal clear the fact that Christian discipleship is not easy, far from it. Paul's instructions here are nothing if not daunting. Our reading from Romans this morning is a call to costly discipleship. Christians are called to a very high standard of behavior, not, let us be clear, in order that we might be, be saved, but rather in response to the grace, forgiveness, and salvation that has already been given to us in Jesus Christ. In fact, it is Jesus who sets this high standard for us. In our reading from Matthew this morning, Jesus reminds us, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Paul's instructions give us guidance for that kind of daily self-sacrifice. This is a model for a cross-shaped life and also for a cross-shaped church. If Christians take Paul's list of expectations seriously, it seems that we are faced with a few choices. First, we can simply ignore them, knowing that we'll never be able to achieve such high standards, and so why bother? Or we can use them as a measuring stick, wielding them like a weapon against each other, determining who is the real Christian and who is not. Or we can make them into another law that convicts us of our sinfulness and drives us to despair. Or, and this is my suggestion, we can accept the fact that the Christian life requires discipline, patience, and grit and also that some of the time, maybe even most of the time, we are going to bomb spectacularly in our efforts. And yet we are going to get up and persevere anyway. It's important to note here that though we tend to read this passage as instructions for individual Christians, Paul is talking to a community of faith. All of the verbal forms are plural. The words are a window on what life is like in Christ, in community. It's almost as if Paul is saying, don't try this alone. How do you get revenge on your enemies? You love them. 
And if we are to practice this kind of genuine love that Paul describes in this passage, we need the help and support of our sisters and brothers in faith. We can't go it alone. And we can't do it, individually or as a community, without God's help. We love, the author of 1 John says, because God first loved us. We can show genuine love to others, including our enemies, because we have known and continue to know God's love for us in the midst of both our individual and communal sin and brokenness. We know God's grace and mercy are endless. We know God's forgiveness is ongoing and boundless. And we know that the Holy Spirit continues to be at work in us always, in both our individual Christian lives as well as in the life of our church, strengthening us and enabling us to do things that without God's presence and help surely would be impossible. No, Christians don't get things easy, but we do get everything we need to, keep, to enable us to keep striving for the difficult life of discipleship to which all Christians are called. Amen. And our song is Let There Be Peace on Earth, hymn number 431 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, even as we sing, let there be peace on earth, we know that there are places in our world, in our communities, in our lives, in our nation, that are far from peaceful. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be a part of bringing peace in those places. We pray that you will strengthen us with your spirit to be peacemakers in our words and our actions, to love even when love is difficult. We give you thanks for your spirit which makes such love possible. We pray for all of those who are in need of your healing this week whether they are dealing with COVID, whether they are facing surgery, 
whether they are dealing with a diagnosis of cancer, we pray, Lord, that in the midst of all the healing that is needed, that you will be present, that you will bring the healing that each most needs. We give you thanks for all of those who are caretakers, who care for others as their profession. And we pray that you will strengthen them for the work that they do. And for all who are caring for family members and loved ones, we pray also that they will have the grace and patience and strength that they need. We pray for all this day who are trapped in cycles of violence, that in the midst of that you would find, help them to find a way out, that you would help them to find strength and courage. We pray for our national leaders, our international leaders, as they seek to deal with the crises that we are facing in our world. We pray that you will give them wisdom. We pray for all of those who have been affected by the, by the hurricane in the Gulf, that you would give them strength as they begin the process of cleaning up and rebuilding. And for all of those in our state who are also cleaning up after a terrible storm, we pray that you will continue to bring them strength and courage and comfort as that work continues. We pray for all first responders who are working in the midst of the disasters and especially we pray for those firefighters who are on the front lines of the fires that are burning in so many parts of our western states. And we pray, Lord, that you will keep them safe, that in the midst of the work that they do, you would give them courage we pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul encourages us, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. In loving service to this loving Lord, we now return to God a portion of the bounty God has provided. May we give generously as God has so generously given to us. And we thank all of those who have sent their gifts in this week and for all the gifts that will re be received this week as well. If you wish to contribute to the ministry of this congregation, you may send your contribution to 200 North Main, Box 4, Oakland, Iowa, 51560. Let us pray. Loving God, we offer to you our gifts for your work and ministry in the world. But even more, Lord, we offer to you ourselves so that your life can live in us and your love flow through us. Accept our offerings and make them holy. Amen. And hear these words of benediction. In the power of the Holy Spirit, go forth into the world to fulfill your calling to live as a person of God, a part of the body of Christ. Let your love be genuine Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in enthusiasm. Be committed in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. 
persevere in prayer. And may the love of Christ fill you, the power of the Spirit sustain you, and the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you, now and always. Amen. And our closing song is number 670, Go Forth for God. <laughs>